Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is The Cube, and we're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium, the CDO Forum. Uh, this is the second year that we've been invited to participate in this forum, and it's been fascinating to see the evolution of the, the chief data officer and how that role has been adopted, particularly within regulated industries, but increasingly other sort of less regulated industries are looking at the role, organizations trying to figure out how to handle data governance with the big data meme really coming to the fore. Professor Stuart Madnick is a, a, a CUBE alum, was here last year. <laughs> Stuart, great to see you again. Thanks for it's, coming it's to the It's a Cube. pleasure, you guys do a fantastic job. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate again. it, it was wonderful to be here. It was really a, a pleasure. It's, it's, so many surprises come out of, uh, of these events and, and, and great guests on theCUBE and, and we really love the collaboration. You gave, uh, you kicked off uh, yesterday, uh, one of the keynotes and, uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, you, you, you picked up on the theme of data quality and you use an example of, uh, you, you broke out the, I think you went to the Smithsonian, you said, <laughs> got the overhead projector, I remember them well. You know, the foils, right? And you had, um, you had a data point that I'd like you to share with the, uh, with the audience. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it's a bit of an amusing one that I've used many years in the past, and, and I was asked to resurrect it, if you will, uh, for another uh, occasion in MIT. And what, what it was a study done probably 20 or 30 years ago, but what the study did is two points. First, the, the, the funny part and then the interesting part was the study that is they measured the average IQ of the entering class of freshmen at MIT. And then four years later, they measured the average IQ of the graduating seniors. And what was interesting, although not a large number, there was a statistically significant drop in IQ between those two studies. Which of course led to all kinds of investigations of why that might be the case. But the thing which I wanted to use it as a motivation, besides being kind of an interesting, funny story about MIT, uh, to motivate the issue of, of data, understanding data quality and such. And that is, in the way I described that experiment, the assumption the average person makes right away is we're talking about the same number of people possibly getting dumber. But there's no guarantee that the graduating seniors four years later were the same people that were measured four years earlier. So that ability to understand exactly the data we're using is so important. And we see time and time again uh, where we un misunderstand our data. Uh, and it leads to whether it be amusing stories like that or it leads to sometimes serious problems occurring. Now you were at the MIT uh, Sloan School and of course you got on the backdrop this year. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're very pleased about that. This is a great backdrop, a lot of collaboration. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, a lot of, it takes a lot of, 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 of folks to make a symposium like this happen. You, of course you come from an environment that is, thrives on collaboration. Yeah. So, so give us some background there. Well, as uh, I introduced our dean, was very generous. He was able to spare the time to come over. And well, I have to uh, interrupt you. You say you were very humble. You say <laughs> your boss is boss is boss is boss is <laughs> boss. You're, 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 you're uh, very humble of you to say that. <laughs> but, but one of the things that he has uh, uh, mentioned and, and has put as part of the mission statement for the Sloan School is basically to have an impact on the world. Mm -hmm. And so, although we do a lot of very scholarly uh, activities at MIT and such, uh, the ability to interact with the professional people, to interact with the public at large, is an important part of our mission. And hosting things like the uh, uh, Chief Data Officer Information Quality Symposium is just one of those things that we have done. And uh, we're very pleased with the kinds of reaction and reception we get uh, from a broad array of people, both in other academic institutions as well as the uh, profession in, at large. I want to go back to your MIT students getting stupider example. Um, not be, just because By the way, if your wife says you don't seem as smart as you were before you left for MIT, we can give her an excuse to blame it on MIT. Oh, no, I, I would blame it on reaching the drinking age during my, during my tenure as a student. But, but um, it really go, it does point to an important uh, issue though, which is truth and, and, and the believability of data. And, and arguably one of the consequences of universal data access, and everybody's a publisher now, and anybody can say anything they want, is that truth has become elusive. We don't really know who to trust anymore. And in fact, 
people can create their version of the truth. Uh, all kinds of bogus research out there done uh, using statistically unsound methods and such. How does that affect how you teach your students about how they go into the world where many of your students will be occupying very important positions in, in uh, uh, technology positions about how they should interpret truth or believe what is true. Well, there's actually two things I want to point out about it. One thing, there is an interesting issue as to getting back to the comment regarding MITs and IQ tests, is what is it that IQ tests actually measure? And basically they measure your ability to answer a certain specific set of questions, which may or may not be correlated with anything to do with your success in life or your ability to be effective and so on. So there's, there's, one of the dangers you run into is exactly what it is you're measuring. And one of the other examples I used uh, to illustrate that point was, uh, I guess it was a while back, maybe 10 years back, there was yet another housing crisis. Housing crisis seemed to occur about every decade or so. And there was a headline in the Boston Globe, which of course is the most authoritative newspaper in the world, that said that good news, you know, housing sales have really picked up. They're way up from last month, way up from last year. Isn't that good news? And it turns out though, when you investigate it further, what they had done is they had gone around to the registry of deeds in the individual counties in Massachusetts and added up the number of deeds that had changed hands or been filed that month. And sure enough, the number was way up. The thing they hadn't considered at that time was that when a bank forecloses on your house, the deed changes hands. And so what actually had happened that month was a record number of foreclosures, not that housing sales had gone up. The reason I mention that, it wasn't that anybody typed the number wrong. The number of actual deeds that had changed hands that month was way up. It was misinterpreted that they jumped to the conclusion that the number of deeds changing hands indicated the number of sales had gone up. So getting back to your point, that's the key thing. You need to dig down to understand. That's one of the core principles of a place like MIT, kind of the, the scientific method to really understand what is the data actually telling you. Isn't this the role that, that, uh, that the, ed uh, the educational institutions have to play is teaching critical thinking so that we don't accept at face value the numbers, uh, the yep. numbers that we see as true? No, I and I love your question because when you come into work life early in a, in a large corporation and somebody puts out a data point, you learn very quickly if the data point supports the political agenda, they, the, the person who markets it best <laughs> you know, gets something done. And if, and, and if it doesn't support their agenda, of course they attack it. Yep. And then of course there's the gut feel, which if you're Steve Jobs is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But for you know, the rest of us, maybe gut feel sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. So, so learning how to actually use data, which is not tri a trivial exercise or discipline, mm. is something that um, is a very valuable skill but one that not a lot of people really know how to do. Well, you're raising actually a couple interesting issues. First, there is the whole political dimension to data, if you will, and that data can be used, and in fact, frequently is used for particular political agendas, whether it be real politics in the government mm -hmm. or politics within an organization, and, and that's always a, a bit of a challenge, but the reality is even more complicated than that, and that is data has a context to it and really understanding exactly what the data means. I, I, you know, th there are so many cases when there is more than one right answer, you know, mathematically right answer, depending upon exactly what you're trying to ask and the circumstances and conditions you're trying to get at. And once again, one of the terms, I, I can't remember who mentioned this in their talk uh, yesterday, but it, it, it's a fascinating concept. People talk about management by uh, exact uh, op objectives or management by this or that, but evidence-based management was an interesting term. I hadn't really heard it before, if someone used it. And in many ways, it's a little bit like evidence-based medicine. You know, rather than basing upon conjectures or guesses or intuitions, you know, can you ba bake, back it up by facts? And the reason why I'm going to be brief here and let you go on, but the reason I bring it up is there's a lot of big uh, excitement over big data. And what I mentioned both last year and this year is what big data allows you to do is allows you to see things that have always existed, but we never had a way to measure or analyze in the past. Uh, we had, I attended a talk uh, just a few weeks ago of someone who was studying political campaigns, as you mentioned politics, if you will. And it turns out there were a lot of generally uh, uh, understood or generally agreed upon principles that people had that when they actually got data that was a hundred times more fine-grained, turned out to be totally wrong. 
assumptions that people are making for decades and the ability to actually, and actually measure, well, how much did this actually change people's opinions? Or how many people changed their vote from this to that? You know, the ability for us, whether it be in politics or in business, to really know what's going on as opposed to guessing. Because most of what we do, whether you call it insights or guessing, is the way most much of management is run. I was just reading the other day that the uh, the, the belief that, that your tongue has different sensitivity areas for sweet, <laughs> so, sweet uh, sour, uh, bitter, and such, it's totally bogus. This is what we were all raised yeah. on. Yeah. I believe that is totally is totally untrue. Yeah. Uh, but but often it's just because we don't question. Yeah. Uh, you brought this article: hazards tied to medical records rush. Subsidies given for computerizing, but no reporting required when errors cause harm. Why did this article strike you? Well, I, I think it's fascinating because. Uh, first, I'm a big fan of data, as you might imagine, and, uh, and the article goes on to talk about the percent of hospitals and doctor's offices that have gone to electronic medical records has skyrocketed because the government's providing strong incentives as well as some, some sticks to go with the carrots, if you will. So that, that's kind of good news. The problem with this kind of change is the, the related issue of worrying about the quality wasn't part of the requirements. The crime was, are you or are you not digitized? Not are you or are you not correctly digitized? And so mm -hmm. the incentive system was to rush to do it, but without any monitoring uh, facility there to, and, and the story goes on to some rather tragic cases. Now these may have happened under human or paper-based systems as much, but a lot of these were, were directly because of the way in which the information systems were being misused. And so these kind of transitions just open up opportunities for all kinds of new problems. And is this a is this a, a risk you see with big data, where you know there's a there's an investment frenzy right now around big data companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, everyone, you know, there's pressure on on every enterprise to 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 go into big data. You're saying that the risk is there that they they'll go into it without knowing why they're doing it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once again, everything has to be uh, balanced, if you will. And any transition, whether it be, I I don't know the records, but when you went from horses to horseless carriages. I don't know how many people had their two horses colliding with each other uh, compared to the number of people colliding their cars together. And so sometimes innovations go through a gestation period uh, that takes a while to sort out. But the mere fact that there are these bumps in the road doesn't mean you should go into it without being open to realizing that it can be bumps in the road and doing everything possible to minimize it. And I think that's where things have been left down, is, is that the rush to getting it automated without the rush to getting it done with quality. That's the missing link. Well, we talked yesterday about the transition from you know, carriage-based transportation to automobiles. One of the big concerns early on was, would there be enough chauffeurs? And yeah. we're using, you know, people <laughs> use that analogy in big data. Will there be enough data scientists? Mm -hmm. And we have to put the, hand, the, the data in the hands of the, the business people mm -hmm. and, and make it simpler to do this analysis. Um, but there's a big gap. Uh, uh, what this conversation's underscoring to me is a big gap between that nirvana and, and, and the data quality that we need and where we are today. Well, it's interesting you use that example because I have a, a, a kind of a similar one. There was a study done, I don't know the actual year, but probably somewhere around 1918 by the telephone company with the rate of telephones being installed and the, and the number of switchboard operators. I can't remember the conclusion, but it was something like the entire adult population of the, of the country would have to be telephone operators in order to handle all the calls being made by the kids. Uh, the interesting question is, is, in one sense, the number of people with telephones more than exceeded their expectations, but we're not all telephone operators. Well, or conversely, we are. We are <laughs> right. Because we've made the process, whether it be touch-tone dialing or even now speaking at your phone, so easy. And I guess and that's the issue of transitioning, is we need to make the tools for managing data easier. easier. And I see it over and over again. The other example I use, if you go back a couple decades or so ago, a lot of things we now do with, with spreadsheets, we did with programmers writing programs in basic or COBOL. Right. And if you ask the average business manager who uses a spreadsheet, are you a programmer? They would laugh at you. But in fact, they're doing the same kinds of things that a programmer would have done a couple of decades earlier, but because it's made so easy and so transparent, they don't have to think of it that way. And that's our challenge, to make the ease of use of data. And that's one of the big things we're seeing. We have a student who did a project called uh, Big Data as a Service, looking at new companies and services being offered that really are trying to bring it up to the, the lay user to be able to manage mm -hmm. big data. Mm -hmm. there, there, 
I do want to be sure we get to a topic that you mentioned before we we, uh, we went on the air, which is uh, the uh, the role of big data and security. Yeah. And I don't see the correlation. Where is it? Exactly. So let me do it in, in kind of th three parts. Kind of visualize this, if you will. Uh, I've often mentioned you've got the CIO's role, and the CIO is very much concerned about the IT infrastructure. They worry about uh, things such as you know uh, firewalls and what have you. In many organizations, particularly organizations either regulated or involved in utilities and so on, you often have a chief uh, security officer. And they worry about both the physical security, but they often worry about things like cryptographic codes and passwords and so on. And now, of course, we're having the emerging chief data officer. Now, why is the chief data officer so important? Well, let's go back to two of the most widely uh, discussed uh, cyber incidents, and that's the WikiLeaks on the one hand, and the NSA at Snowden on the other hand. Would a better firewall have stopped that? Would a better cryptographic code have stopped that? The answer is no, it had a lot to do with the organizational structure and the organizational training and what went on. That's not part of the CIO's role normally. Not part of the CSO's role normally. If you think about what the role of the CDO should be, how the data is used, who uses it and for what purpose, should be dead center of the CDO's role. And so if you really want to address cybersecurity, you have to have all those three players working together in unison with the CDO playing an increasingly important role. I, I don't have the hard data for this, criticism myself, I guess, uh, <laughs> but that my intuition is that half or more of what we think of as cyber break-ins are, are all to do with people management and, and data control, if you will. Not well, we to, know that, in, yeah. that internal security it, breaches are the most common exactly. form of security and, and, and that, I think, clearly is a role that the CDO needs to be dead center on. That's the connection I see there. I did want to say one other thing, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, Jeannie Ross, I guess, was also interviewed, yeah. and she's a fantastic person. And she had a very, I think she mentioned a very controversial title in her article called something like, You Don't Need Big Data. Uh, and she explained, I think, in the talk and also here, what she really meant was that most organizations have so much small data that they don't know how to use. Don't worry about the big data that you don't know how to use. And I agree completely about that. And the reason I mentioned that, as I did last year, you got the cube here. And one of the things we talked about, uh, we, we developed last year, we just published it in January, is we call the CDO cube. That is the role of the CDO across three dimensions. Uh, one dimension is whether they are inward looking or outward looking, whether they're worried about how to improve the operation within their company or how to improve the collaboration with their suppliers and partners and so on. Another direction we call is kind of the value, whether they're trying to uh, be kind of an operational person or a strategic person. But the third dimension we talk about is the type of data they're looking at. And in that we refer to traditional data or what she would call the small data, the data you already have but are probably not using very well. And then what, uh, we thought of calling nouveau data, but we left it with being big data. And once again, it can be CDOs whose focus can be on that little data. Because I suspect that we're getting, much like to talk about our brain power, they're only using a small fraction of it. I suspect the same thing to do with data, is that the amount of value in the data that we've had and have had for decades and don't know how to use very well is enormous. Interesting. So, I wonder, you know, I was just saying, I've never asked this question before. We, you know, we had Moore's Law and during the microprocessor yeah. revolution, we had Metcalf's Law yeah. during the internet revolution. Is there an analog, you know, Metcalf's Law in the, in the big data world? And, and your, your three-dimensional cube just sort of got me thinking. Well, you know? I, I'm, uh, and Traditionally, you know, Metcalf's Law, the network nodes increase linearly, but the value increases exponentially. It's always been the opposite for data. Yeah. The more data we have, the less value we seem to be able to get out of it, although that seems to be changing. Well, I think there's two, two issues. Once, in some cases, if you're looking for some kind of a trend, often you can determine a trend with modest amounts of data, and just getting a, uh, you know, two more digits of accuracy doesn't change what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But I think where, where the opposite is true is there are certain types of phenomenons that can only be discovered when you get to very detailed level data. Uh, the example I, I used last year, so I won't go through it again, was the discovery of the microscope to be able to recognize you know, insects, if you will, that is uh, uh, you know, bacteria and so on in water. Well, the, the same kind of idea, there's, there's a level of detail about our society, a level of detail about our own human behavior that we've never had an ability to measure in the past before. 
And by being able to measure it, we can uncover uh, all kinds of things, uh, ranging from work done by my colleague, uh, Sandy Pentland at MIT, in uncovering early stage certain types of diseases, just by detecting subtle changes in your body motions that can be picked up on your accelerometer and such. So there are some things for which having that extra fine-grained data is very valuable. Mm. Not everything, but for many things. We've talked uh, about, the, about the data scientist uh, here, how that role is evolving, uh, how many uh, uh, you know, academic institutions now are, are adding uh, disciplines around data science. Uh, understanding that you can't speak for MIT as a whole, how would you say that, that, that you look at that in terms of what role MIT should provide in, in training data scientists for the future? Well, I think there's two parts to that, again. Uh, I think MIT, as kind of an engineering-based school, even in a, in a business school, we have a significant amount of activities going on in operational research, statistics, and so on. So the idea of having managers who are not afraid of numbers, we think, is an important role, and that's one of the things we've done long before big data ever came on the scenes. Uh, MIT's operations research center, uh, came, which came about after World War II, has been one of the leading uh, institutions in that regard. So I think as a, as a role of trying to make people comfortable with information and data, I think that's always been our role. I think the thing that we believe will change over time is it'll become easier and easier and be more ingrained. Think of it now. I, I go into a restaurant and I see a three or four year old kid at another table playing with his iPad while waiting for the meal to be served. You know, not rocket science, but you know, think of it, that's a computer thousands of times more powerful than the biggest computer MIT had 30 or 40 years ago. And here's a three or four year old just using it for games. So the ability to take a lot of this power and put it into people's hands, and you can be older than three years old, by the way, if you want to be, uh, I think that's, and I think a lot of work going on at MIT and elsewhere is trying to take the early state. You made a comment earlier about the reason why we had chauffeurs, besides the fact that they only were available for rich people, was you had to be a mechanic to yeah, get right. the motor to work. Right. You had to know how to crank it up, you had to worry about you know, adjusting the spark gap and all that stuff. And so in the same vein, we, we have to have chauffeurs for our data at this stage until we get to the point we made it easy enough for the average person to use. Mm. And I, I think it's just a matter of time, and as we talk about the internet time, things happen faster and faster. So that, that's our vision, is that, is that you need to be not afraid of numbers, but you don't have to be able to do it all yourself. Stuart, so we have to leave it there. Sure. You're a great guest. Thank you so much oh, for coming always on. Always a pleasure. I hope we can be back next year and, and have you on again. Thank you very much. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. We're live at MIT Information Quality Symposium. We'll be right back after this. This is theCUBE.